take off. Seven o'clock on a Saturday night, so we can get this thing kick started, <laughs> so so that we can uh, be done by eight o'clock as scheduled. Uh, this is a, the panel on cyber adversary characterization, and just to introduce the panelists. My, I'm Matt Devoe with the Terrorism Research Center. Toby Miller, independent security consultant. Tom Parker, Pen Test Limited in the UK, and Mark Sachs from the Department of Homeland Security. We're going to speak to you uh, on cyber adversary characterization, why it's important, and discuss some models that Toby and Tom have been developing to help them in the characterization process. Just to give you a little background, uh, we all met up for a two-day workshop on this topic in 2002, uh, continued to do some research via email, discussions back and forth, and then uh, Tom put together the panels to come here to Black Hat and DEF CON to introduce the concept and obtain some feedback. Uh, a lot of the models, a lot of the issues that we're looking at are in early development. We think there's a lot of utility for them, but we need to get feedback from the community as well. Uh, we plan on doing a future workshop in October 2003, uh, and just FYI, the slides will be on the, the conference websites uh, for both Black Hat and DEF CON. I know they're not here. Why characterize? There's a theoretical side to it, to gain an understanding and ability to anticipate an adversary in order to Im uh, build improved threat models, and that's a piece I'm going to talk to, is the threat model component. And then improved profiling of attackers at post-attack and forensic level to guide response and to give you an idea of exactly who you're dealing with. I was asked to come in and speak about threat assessment, put some of the modeling in context, and then talk about some of the issues that we look at in uh, looking at cyber terrorism or profiling of cyber terrorism. I'm going to spend 10 minutes on that. Biggest point I want to make with regards to why I think this topic is important is because your adversary is not a one or a zero. A lot of time when doing uh, analysis of attacks or looking at risk management concepts, you're told about the packet that's the attack. And very little attention is given to the intent, motivations, capabilities of the person behind the attack. Uh, so it's an effort to try and move it beyond just the technical to start thinking about who you're dealing with to guide your response and also if you have a perspective with regards to what threats you're facing, what your adversary's capabilities are, it can also guide your security posture to a certain extent. I'm involved in the concept of risk management, which includes you know, vulnerability assessment, threat assessment, uh, doing some of this modeling, and you can't do risk management, you can't incorporate a risk analysis without doing the threat assessment or adversary characterization. And we're out, especially with private industry, a lot of times they have these risk management models with a threat component, but for cybersecurity issues, there's no threat piece injected into it. So a lot of times funding isn't provided or the models aren't accurate for what they're trying to uh, achieve within the organization. The whole point is without the threat analysis, you're not performing real risk management. Uh, and if you're not doing risk management, you can't have concept of acceptable risk, which means you're either trying to protect against everything or you're not protecting against much. And thanks to Jay Healy for the, your adversary is not a one or a zero quote. What things do we look at when trying to do risk exposure? What threats adversaries exist? That's this piece here that you're going to hear about. What tools, capabilities can you use? Also some of the, the research that they're doing. How attractive is the target? This is where we have to look at the goal, intent, likelihood of a system being targeted. What level of access can be obtained? This is classic vulnerability assessment process. This is something that the, the industry is really good at, actually, is going out and doing the assessment piece and looking at vulnerabilities and fixing vulnerabilities. We just don't put them into context very often. What impact would the attack have? And then also there needs to be a safeguard component here. Need to be doing it for a reason in order to guide the security process. Threat agents of interest, let's list the ones that we use. Just for your information, you'll see when Mark gives his presentation, they have a similar list that they use within DHS. This is kind of how we break it down. And then needed to categorize techniques as well. We obviously can't look at all of the different ways that systems can be impacted. So we had to come up with a high-level categorization. And this is the list that we use right now that includes everything from uh, penetration to insider placement, malicious code, a whole slew of things. And obviously, depending on the system you're looking at, not all of them are looked at. 
cyber terrorism analysis, the piece that I focus a lot of my attention on, the camps on cyber terrorism are divided into two distinct communities right now. Uh, you really have those that think that uh, in Camp A, that bin Laden lurks in every monitor and is prepared to take down the power on the East Coast tomorrow. Uh, and then in Camp B, that terrorists out there have no technical capability and pose no threat whatsoever. And that's kind of the environment that I see, whether I'm working with uh, government or industry, that typically they're over paranoid about the threat or not concerned at all. And the truth kind of lies somewhere in the middle. That's some of the stuff that I want to speak to. Characterizing cyber terrorists, it's tough because we don't have any historical analysis. At least with some of the stuff that uh, Tom and Toby are doing, they're looking at actual attackers, they're looking at history from past attacks. But with cyber terrorists, in my opinion, we've never had a true incident of cyber terrorism. So you can't use that past analysis to try and drive your profile. You need to be a little bit more creative. Uh, you need to imagine the threat. Uh, at a conference that we were at uh, about a year ago, there is an interview with Alvin Toffler, and he describes September 11th as a failure of imagination. That stuck with me on the cyber terrorism side because it is one of those threats that you need to imagine a little bit in order to give it some reality. You can red team the threat, which is something that gets done. Characterize capabilities and intent. It's a little tougher, but if you're red teaming it, you can assume different levels of capabilities. You can put stuff in models like uh, what Tom has done. Assess and fix vulner vulnerabilities. And then understanding what's happening right now. One of the big issues, and I think that Mark will speak to it, when an attack takes place, you either have to assume the worst or assume the best. And we'd like to put a little bit more granularity on that during the incident response process. <clears throat> Key issues for cyber terrorism. And these are things that, that uh, we discussed at the workshop or that I briefed uh, that I thought were important to looking at the cyber terrorism threat. The first being that there's kind of a nature of terrorism has changed from international versus single issue groups, those that engaged in kind of calculated violence versus those that are interested in mass casualty, mass consequence. Uh, and the whole point we're trying to make in looking at that first bullet was to show that some groups are going to be displaced and might use cyber terrorism as a differentiator. So we kind of needed to open the scope and look at it as being attractive by, by groups that necessarily wouldn't be attracted to it because they want to differentiate themselves from the uh, al-Qaeda of the world. Uh, the model, the thing that we actually looked at for one assessment was hijackings. You know, 700 plus hijackings prior to September 11th, either used to flee a geographic region, attract media attention to a particular cause, or to use the plane and the passengers as a bargaining chip in some sort of political negotiation. Of those groups that were engaging in hijacking for those purposes, how many now would engage in hijacking because it would be perceived as an intent to use the plane as a weapon of mass destruction. So we thought that was important. The other thing we wanted to, that we thought was important was the fact that terrorists go through a lesson learned process and to look and see what lessons can we draw from cyberspace and critical infrastructure failures or from attacks that we've seen within other threat environments that terrorists might look at and learn from, whether they're successful or even if it's a failed attack. Long-term planning cycle we thought was important. Uh, when folks speak of cyber terrorism, they like to think of it as a threat that's there tomorrow. And when you have an adversary group that'll take five years in the planning, you know, development of the capability and execution of an attack, we need to think in a little bit more of an expanded time window. Targets once identified will be continually attacked until destroyed. Thought that was important, uh, especially when you start trying to do adversary characterization in event of a real incident. And then convergence, issues of convergence. Will terrorists converge with hackers a la hacktivism? Can capability be acquired or recruited uh, from outside? We've looked at issues of convergence between terrorist organized crime, terrorist nation states. So I think it was important to look at issues of convergence elsewhere. I have a question now. How would you define the, the definition that I use is a sustained attack. In other words, it's not something that just happens quickly and goes away. A sustained attack against a critical infrastructure with the intent of having some sort of political coercive impact or causing uh, public panic, fear, and disruption. So it, uh, it's kind of a fuzzy somewhat definition, <clears throat> but I try and isolate it or move it away from 
just a hack attack or just somebody's simple denial of service attack to move it into more a scope of conventional terrorism where you have a sustained event, <clears throat> have something with much greater impact than just an isolated attack or a terrorist organization in South America writing a virus uh, and releasing it on the net. We wanted to try and move it outside that realm. Likely aspects of cyber terrorism. This comes from a paper that we wrote and posted on our website uh, several months ago. We thought this was important as well because it kind of guides when you're doing the system assessment whether the system you're looking at falls into one of these categories and where it falls into the category will kind of guide the attractiveness of the target. We thought and still think that the most likely aspect of cyber terrorism is going to be in parallel with a physical or WMD attack, uh, where they're going to try and augment the impact of something that's been done in the physical domain. Maybe it's go after telecommunications, after doing a bombing, going after hospital systems. There are a whole slew of scenarios, but we still think that that's probably the most likely aspect in which it'll be used, is not as a replacement for physical attack, but actually to augment a physical attack. Go ahead. Yeah, let's, there, it's actually kind of covered in bullet number two. And let's re-raise that issue during the Q&A. Uh, and we'll probably hold all questions. We've got 20 minutes set aside, and I don't want to impact on the presentations for the other guys. Uh, but we'll address that during the Q&A. And it is addressed a little bit in number two, which is to decrease confidence in critical infrastructures or engage in psychological operations, where you go after infrastructures uh, that, it's, that had nothing to do with a physical attack or associated with a physical attack, but you're going after things that will decrease confidence and, and cause the public to fear. Uh, living in Washington, D.C., we saw the impact, the psychological impact of two guys with a Bushmaster rifle. Uh, there was economic impacts. People changed their behavior. They zigzagged to their cars. There were lots of outlying effects based upon little isolated attacks. And from a cyber terrorism perspective, if you launched a campaign against critical infrastructures and caused that loss of public confidence, started having the economic impacts. We think that that's also attractive as well. Uh, to cause physical damage or loss of human life, this is the most attractive to a terrorist organization because it lets them uh, blend two different types of attacks. You still get to kill people, you still get the spectacular, but you also get to launch the attack from Pakistan or geographically uh, different. You don't have to put the person on the target to engage in it. Uh, that's also, from our perspective, the least probable just based on experience in assessing infrastructures and the fact that there are still a lot of physical safeguards, humans in the loop, things of that sort. Not impossible, but a higher risk to try and make that happen where the other two become more attractive. And then the, the, the point I wanted to throw in as well is we tend to put the blinders on uh, when looking at issues right now. Uh, and to not forget the nation state as a sponsor or using as a tool of strategic influence. I think Mark will address that a little bit as well, but we just want to make sure we don't fall into the blame bin Laden game where any attack, whether it's a hacker uh, or a nation state, starts getting characterized as an act of cyber terrorism. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Toby, who's going to uh, talk about his uh, hacker rating model. Do you want the wireless? Hi, my name is uh, Toby Miller. 
I'm here to speak on the, the model that I, I've been working on for the past year, off and on for the past year. It's about uh, rating your attacker. Um, if you want to get in touch with me and you, or you have any comments about the presentation, my uh, email address is up there. So go ahead and uh, email me your, your comments. Um, basically, my model or what I came up with is like a, uh, a checklist. And it has points asso associated with uh, different events and uh, different uh, categories as to as for what the what the attacker you know physically did uh, why did I do it uh, one of the one of the reasons that I did it was that because I hadn't seen any tool out there that an analyst um, IDS analyst firewall administrator security administrator whatever could use to help rate the skill level the potential skill level of his or her attacker um, I also did it so it would help management, assist management in determining uh, incident response requirements and also to help management with threat level um, management as well. Um, in, my, in my system, I have uh, six categories, actually. Um, they are uh, passive fingerprinting, the intelligence gathering, uh, the attack, the exploit, uh, backdoors and cover-up, and others. Uh, passive fingerprinting, uh, this covers, this, when you get a packet in, coming in, or you know, if you have it, um, I personally think that the operating system could tell a lot about the attacker. Yes, the operating system can be fooled. Uh, it can be spoofed just like an IP, um, but it's still, it's still there. You still can use it as, as part of your analysis. Intelligence gathering, this, good, this covers everything from social engineering to sending a single packet to a uh, service to see if you get a response. The attack, it is like um, if the attack was uh, cross-site scripting, if it was SQL injection, whatever, I rate that as well. The exploit, the exploit is, it goes along with uh, tools which Tom will get into a little bit more in depth than I will. And backdoors, um, in my experience, the past five, six, seven years, there's usually three phases of an attack. You have the intelligence gathering uh, standpoint, you know, somebody probes your box or whatever. Sometimes they don't. You have the attack, and you also have the cover-up. Once they get your box, there's usually some kind of rootkit, whether it's a single file, whether it's a torn-based rootkit, something like that, or even an LKM, or a Windows-based rootkit, and that will cover that as well. And then you have my, my last one, which is others, um, and that basically uh, that covers everything that the first five doesn't. Um, what I'm doing right now, originally I posted this thing to Incidents about this time last year, incidents.org. I posted it to uh, the Incidents mailing list along with some other mailing lists. I got some comments back. Um, I made some changes right now on my website. I'm up to revision number two. Um, I'm working currently on revision number three. Um, I've made some changes uh, for revision three. Um, like, for instance, uh, for revision number three, one of, a lot of the comments that I've gotten back in the past couple months, uh, as far as this goes, is destination, the destination server. Um, as far as the destination, the destination server can be critical in evaluating your your uh, enemy as far as to what he's going after. Uh, for instance, uh, my, in my new model, I'm going to have the wor a workstation. It's going to go down to a class, you know, if you're a government person, you deal with classified information, that's going to, that's going to, you're going to treat that a little bit more seriously than you would somebody just attacking a, somebody's personal workstation. It's going to also have, a, 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 include a bank related server. All the, all these different things are going to be scored and have different point values. Um, currently, the point values are, are between 1 and 5. I'm about to change that and make them 1 to 10. Um, and uh, one of the other comments I, I, I had, and I'm going to incorporate it, is uh, source IP. Can it be spoofed, or is it, or is it real? Basically, is it real, or is it Memorex? Um, that's, that's been uh, some of the other comments that, uh, that I've had as far as this uh, uh, model goes. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to actually bring, bring the model up and go into depth in it. But uh, if you want to visit the model, 
make comments or whatever, it's at ratingthehacker.net. And revision three should be up in about a week, week and a half or whatever. So uh, that being said, here's Tom to go into tool characterization. Okay, so um, Toby touched briefly on the, the idea of uh, the point scoring system that, we, uh, that we've come up with. Uh, I'm going to go into the, uh, the, some parts of that system in, in some more depth. Um, firstly, uh, one concept which we've come up with um, is the hacker pie. Um, one of the reasons um, we think that what we're doing has so much potential is because um, the IDS guys for some years now have been taking uh, log data and what have you and trying to analyze it to, to get some kind of idea of the, you know, the kind of people we're dealing with out there. Um, although uh, we think that is obviously of great value to us, um, it's not the be all and end all of the characterization. Uh, we have different sides to this. We have the psychological side. We have obviously the technical side. Um, the, the more we do the research, we've, we've, the more sides we're finding to it. Um, and obviously the research isn't completed yet. Um, so um, the, the, the other advantage of, of, of you know, not relying upon one piece of the pie is that obviously um, in, when an incident occurs, you're not always going to have you know, lots of information available to you. Sometimes you'll have technical information available to you. Sometimes you'll have a clue you know, who's, you know, who's in, involved in the attack. Um, and the idea is that you know we, we can build up this characterization with separate parts of the pie without having to have them all to, to, to create the final characterization. Okay. Um, the, um, the first type, the, the two models I'm going to go over today are um, technique and tool classification. Um, Technique classification looks at the uh, reconnaissance techniques an attacker may use before an attack, um, the, the types of exploits they're using, um, for example, port scanning techniques. Um, is it stealthy, um, or are they just going through your network, you know, scanning everything, you know, not really caring about, you know, who's watching them? Um, the exploitation technique, are they using mass routers, or are they very carefully deciding what operating system you're using and make, ensuring that the exploit will work the first time around. Um, tool classification, um, obviously um, the tools used um, are, are going to gel with, with the techniques being used. Um, for example, um, if, if, you're, um, you know, if you're randomly scanning through the network, the chances are you could be using Nmap. Um, we're characterizing the kinds of people that use Nmap um, and the other scanning tools. Um, another example would be um, exploits, obviously, which fall under tools. Um, a recent one um, will be the DCOM um, mass routing exploit, which um, is being traded in the underground. Um, the original exploit by HDM um, exploited uh, six different targets. Um, Windows, uh, well, a vanilla Windows 2000 through to um, XP Service Pack 1. Um, the mass router which was written um, went through A-class networks um, trying each target um, on the individual IP addresses. If the guy that wrote this had any clue what he was doing, he would have realized, um, I hope he isn't in the room today, I, uh, he would have realized that um, you know th this exploit is a one shot. You know the first time uh, you get it wrong, the, the service dies, and that's that. Um, and obviously, um, that says two things. Firstly, about the person that wrote it, um, which is the first the first characterization we can make, and the second, uh, the kind of people that are likely to to use this exploit, uh, you know, are going to be your low end adversary that don't really understand what's going on. Okay, um, in the tool classification model, um, the first point we have here is availability of the application. Obviously, certain tools um, are less um, available to, to certain individuals. Um, you have, you know, obviously zero-day exploits, um, which are traded normally uh, between quite, quite close-knit uh, groups of people. Um, we have, we look at the origin of uh, the applications that people are using, um, and the ease of use. Um, 
with uh, obviously you know doing an MMAP scan is fairly trivial. Trivial. It's a, a few command line switches, um, but in the case of exploits, does an attacker need to find the return address? Um, does the attacker need to know something about that system beforehand? Um, are there other mitigating factors? You know, if, if they're trying to perform a man-in-the-middle attack, do they already need to have you know access to a DNS server to you know to poison the network or art poison or what have you? Um, this kind of ties in with what we call the uh, vulnerability disclosure food chain. Um, this, we, we originally developed a metric which was pretty much a pyramid, um, the top of the pyramid representing where a, a, someone discovers a, a vulnerability, and the bottom um, representing the, the public dissemination of that um, vulnerability. Um, the idea is that the bigger the pyramid gets, the more people know about the, uh, the bug. Um, we uh, developed that into more of a, a web diagram because the, the pyramid wasn't uh, very detailed, um, which, which basically describes the, the, the attempts to describe the path of the flow of um, a vulnerability through to exploit writing. You know, maybe it gets traded on, on IRC. Maybe uh, you know the, the guy finding it just you know is responsible at it, about it and tells the vendor. Um, and the characterization part comes in because we try and place um, the adversary on that. Um, food chain, um, and what we think is, depending on how high up they are, um, is, is a determination of you know, what kind of adversary they are. Um, this also um, applies to group characterizations, because as well as having individual characterizations, you can also characterize groups of people. Um, you know, if, if someone attacks your network with a, with a zero-day um, bind exploit, um, and we know that that bind exploit exists, um, and it's been, been written by um, a hacking group that is known of, um, we can perhaps determine the kind of um, arsenal that the other members of that group have access to, um, just as in, in real warfare, um, knowing the, uh, the weapons an enemy has, you know, it, it's also good to, to know the weapons uh, a cyber adversary possesses. Um, <clears throat> knowing uh, the, the group which a certain individual is a member of um, also um, helps to determine their age group. Um, the, the social demeanor um, of the individual, you know, the kind of social group that they're going to be in. Um, a lot of attacks like social engineering um, we find um, require um, a fairly mature intelligence um, and the kind of people that are likely to, 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 um, to go out um, using social engineering in a commercial environment or government environment uh, are one standard deviation age group higher than your average script kitty. Um, okay, I'm just going to leave you with this before we move on to Marcus. Um, this is um, a cut-down version of the, the disclo disclosure food chain, which I put together, in fact, for, for one of the workshops we did on this topic. Um, at the top there, you have the vulnerability discovery um, information shared with uh, the exploit community, uh, with, with, with the community directly around him. You know, maybe it gets leaked, gets traded on FNET, um, there you go. Um, so th that's that's the, uh, the the model that we use to uh, for that metric. Okay, I'll, uh, Marcus. You done? Yeah. Good evening. I'm Mark Sox, Homeland Security. Thanks for coming out, and I appreciate you taking your time when you could be off uh, drinking beer, although I'm sure some of you are, and uh, having a little bit of pizza. So if, if I get thirsty, if somebody wants to throw something up here, I'll, uh, I'll take it. Looking around the audience, I see a lot of feds, so we won't do a spot the fed, um, maybe a spot the hacker. Maybe we could do that while we're here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> glad to see a lot of friendly faces, uh, members of the media and others that are in here. We'll keep this brief because I know everybody does want to move along. What I want to talk about is how we do threat characterization. It's a little bit different from what you were just seeing. And uh, that may fill up the slide a little bit there. But the cyber threat to the United States is, uh, is unique in the sense of we have what we call critical infrastructure. Most of you probably heard me talk about that before. You've seen the, um, the writings that we've had in Homeland over the last several years. But our information networks that we have coast to coast, we recognize that vulnerability. This is well documented. We've looked at it over the years and we're doing quite a bit to uh, protect it. But what we're seeing is that both secure and insecure networks now are starting to converge together. We're, we've got some networks that are doing the right thing. Their network administrators, their security officials are doing exactly what they need to do. 
but unfortunately they have to do commerce with those people who don't quite get it yet. We have to interconnect those networks in order to make e-commerce work. So that, that raises a level of, of threat to those protected networks because they have to interconnect with those who aren't quite as well protected. Plus the complexity of the networks continue to grow. The complexity of the tools, the way we architect them, each year we get new technologies. Uh, we've gone from copper to fiber to wireless. Uh, we've got new protocols coming down to point. We're going to move from V4 to V6, uh, IP-based. And a key bullet here at the bottom is that cascading failures. We're not really sure if the entire infrastructure of the United States could have a cascading failure or whether it will be resilient like the original ARPANET, which was designed to, if it took a hit in one location, the network just routes around it. Now, on September 11th, when we had physical damage in downtown uh, Lower Manhattan, we did in, see, in fact see the data networks route very nicely around the physical damage. But we had catastrophic collapse of the steam networks, the water, the gas and oil, all the other infrastructures that are in Lower Manhattan because they aren't designed to route around physical damage. Could something like that play over on a national effort? If we had a failure of the East Coast Rail Network, could that catastrophe play over and have cascading effects across the United States? We don't know. We hope we never get to that point to find out. But it is something to think about when you start looking at the different types of threats that come at us. Now, as was mentioned earlier, the way we like to look at cyber threats, and we'll step away from the physical world and just talk cyber, the range is, is you know, quite vast. I mean, it, it, I have it at the top, but you could think of it at the bottom end. Um, in terms of numbers, the top bullet, hackers, script kiddies, hobbyists, millions. Pretty much anybody who has access to the Internet has a little bit of curiosity, wants to kind of play around a little bit. Uh, even a home user that's sitting behind a DSL or a cable connection that's not adequately patched or has not taken any type of precautions with the machine falls into that category. They are a threat to our critical infrastructure because they're not taking uh, the right steps to secure their computer. Somebody would like to come in if you want to let them join the party. If they have beer, they're welcome. <laughs> if not, they have to go around. Um, disgruntled employees, insiders, hacktivists, we kind of make our way down the list there. We're at the bottom, state-sponsored. We're talking nations attacking each other in cyberspace. Very few of those. But if we take these, these types of threats and we arrange them on a, on a picture, we can see that the probability of occurrence of like the hacker script kitty world is way off on the high side. There's a lot of that out there. There's a, a, a lot of the, the numbers are large, but the potential damage they can do in a relative scale is much lower than the damage that could be caused by terrorist groups or well-funded nation states. However, the numbers of well-funded nation states are extremely small compared to the numbers of, say, criminals or script kitties. I think everybody can see the relationship there. But a, a Defense Science Board study done a few years ago showed that that curve that you draw actually is moving outwards in time. So that a hacker today might have a certain level of skill, but four years from now, they have the same level of skill as today's terrorist groups. Of course, today's terrorist groups, four years from now, will have a much more increased skill as well. So that whole line continues to advance outward. And we have seen this effect over the years as the level of clue continues to grow uh, on the offensive side as well as on the defensive side. One thing, though, that about all these threats is the way they manifest themselves is the same. It doesn't matter if you're an individual hacker, script kitty. It doesn't matter if you're a well-sponsored na nation state. The way you're going to break into my computer is the same way. You're going to come through some type of internet connection. You might use social engineering. Some vulnerability, some hole, some place is how you're going to gain access. Why is that happening? Well, I've got a few bullet items up here. The internet, as we all know, was never built to be secure. It was designed to connect people together. It was designed to take academia, governments, researchers, the military, glue them together in a network where everybody could talk. Security wasn't an issue. Security today is an issue, so we're going back and we're re-engineering the networks. We had a lot of obscure software. For example, the software that runs the telecommunications world, the uh, five ESS switches and the SS7 switching networks, Largely proprietary, but now we're starting to move over to voice over IP and we're using commercial protocols that many people have access to. So where we had security through obscurity by very, little, very few people who understood how the software worked, that's getting changed and replaced by commercial software. Insecurities are being moved in. Software companies themselves have always focused on making something that's sellable. We want it to be slick. You know, we want it to, to sell. Security is not an issue. 
And of course, we've always had problems with leadership, not understanding the problem, system administrators being under underfinanced and such. So that has left us in a very vulnerable state so that these threat actors, regardless of what they are, can come at a vulnerable system and it doesn't matter if it's a hacker or a script kitty or all the way up to the nation state, they can still manifest themselves the same way. So this is why we're really concerned about the bottom end, where there are so many, the, the, and I say the word hacker, and we all understand, you know, the connotation, hacker, cracker, etc. I'm just going to use the term that everybody likes to use. I label myself as a hacker, also. I've been doing this stuff for years, but not illegally. I've stayed on the, the right side of the law. But the, the threat, of course, is the nation state. I mean, we would we would expect to see China or Russia or some large nation want to come at us, nation state against nation state. Clearly, the largest threat to our infrastructures. But what happens if some kid out there playing around on his parents computer high-speed connection all of a sudden it's like the million monkeys typing on a million keyboards one of them eventually types some Shakespeare well what's the number of hackers that are out there are we up to a million yet you know is it a million monkeys typing on a million keyboards it's the same phenomenon one of them will get lucky and that one individual will probably score a hit much larger than some nation state can score so we're very concerned about that phenomenon that one individual that will get it right so we take it serious. It doesn't matter where the attack's coming from. It doesn't matter who's breaking into government systems, critical infrastructures. We assume the worst. Assume it's a nation state, and then we start backing off from there until we can get clear attribution. This is a very hard lesson because when you have people who are trying to just kind of probe at us and let's see if we can screw with the monkey a little bit, what they don't realize is that on our side of the coin, we don't know where it's coming from. We have to take it serious in terms of protecting the critical infrastructures, and we may misfire not recognizing that it's just somebody out there pranking about. A couple of things I just want to leave you with. Uh, we've got strategies in Homeland Security. You can pull them off the uh, White House website. It's the best place to get it. Be sure it's whitehouse.gov, not whitehouse.com. <laughs> None of y'all have been there before, so you're just laughing with me, right? Not laughing at me. Um, Go and please, if you do, download the cybersecurity strategy as well as the physical strategy. If you look in the cyber one, you'll see there's a cup. There are paragraphs in there where we talk about the threats. We characterize what these threats look like. But we also make a case that say, even though we want to understand the threats, we want to understand the risk equation, system administrators and leaders can really do something about vulnerabilities. If you can cut down on the vulnerabilities, cut down on the exposures, patch systems, turn off processes that aren't in use, you know, uh, have a, a better password policy, train your users, those types of vulnerabilities, it really then doesn't matter where the threat comes from. It doesn't matter how it manifests itself because you've protected yourself, you've gotten rid of the low-hanging fruit, and now the threat can go next door and go after somebody else. So that's a key point that we try and drive home. In the strategy, we have five priorities. I've just shown number two here because we also address that what we're doing at Homeland Security, out of these five priorities, number two, and they're all equally important, is to address the concept of threat reduction and vulnerability reduction. And we're going to be putting some serious dollars into this, into R&D, as well as uh, public awareness and training, and getting the government more secure, which of course will then mean the, the buying and purchasing of products, which brings product prices down. So we're doing quite a bit of work here to move this forward, and we absolutely appreciate all the input we're getting from the private sector, from industry, and from private citizens. So please keep it coming. Tell us how we can do this stuff better. With that, I think we open up to questions. And we've got at least 20 minutes or so, unless you're thirsty. I mean, and I'll, let me sit down, and then we'll just take the questions as they come. Or do you want to moderate? Any questions? Got one right here. I was asking uh, in my second slide, I say some should be blocked and some shouldn't. And I don't know, I'll go to my slide and you can point it out to me. One, two. Is that the slide you're speaking to? Yeah, I'm not, uh, on that, I'm not speaking specifically to uh, terrorists or cyber terrorists and speaking within the context of risk management and taking kind of a private industry perspective. Uh, it's not fair to ask a particular uh, private industry to protect against the nation state threat, perhaps. Uh, there might be 
uh, risks there or exposure that are only in the context of the capabilities of a nation state and in their risk assessment model, it's not going to be likely that they're going to protect against it. Whereas a government system where they see themselves as a greater threat or a greater risk to facing that adversary, they might hold them to that higher level. Uh, it's all about the concept of acceptable risk and doing risk management. You'll never have full protection, but if you do the threat characterization, then at least you can start to say, in the industry that we're in, we think we need to protect against the following threats that have the following types of capabilities. And we might leave ourselves open to a high-end adversary that has a higher-end capability, but because we have limited resources, we're going to acknowledge the fact that we can't protect against everything. Yeah. Mark, did you yeah, want to? So what's your question? <laughs> question is, my question is, I, 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 I don't see significant efforts. I see that the Homeland Security is still trying to focus on digital protection of government, building the systems. Instead, I think we should try to build a process, to build a, 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 an analysis for policing and for and to, uh, and enforcement. Well, let, let me just, yeah, we didn't talk, I mean, there's a lot more I didn't talk about. You got a about table mic. Uh, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. But I think they're recording, though, so they... Oh, are we recording? Yeah. All right. Just one, two. Okay. Um, there's a lot more we didn't talk about. Where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> You're blending in. You're wearing black. I'm sorry. Um, crime prevention, for example, is one aspect of security. Vulnerability reduction is another aspect of security. Uh, threat characterization is another aspect of it. Um, those in the law enforcement world, when, when we ask them what is security, a lot of times crime prevention is the angle they go after. What can we do? Just like in the physical world, to prevent crimes, we put locks on doors, you know, we close windows, you park your car in a well-lit area. All that's oriented on crime prevention. But if somebody breaks into your car, like you say, there are mechanisms for prosecution, for, for surveillance, for arresting and such. We are making a lot of strides in doing that in, in the cyber world as, as well, but naturally it's well behind the physical world. Um, in terms of spending, that becomes a risk assessment for the various companies or, or individuals or whoever's having to make that assessment. Do you put your dollars into physical or do you put your dollars into cyber? That's a decision you have to make based on your risk assessments. Where is the most likely attack against your resources going to come from? And where will the largest dollar damage, or whatever the, the, the currency is of your country, if somebody attacks? What would one shot do to you? If somebody took one shot at a server and took it out, you can rebuild it. What if they took a second one, or a third one, or a fourth one? At what point does your company break? Or if somebody physically went in and raided your warehouse, you know, did a physical theft, how many of those instances can you survive before your company fails? That's a risk assessment that companies have to take onto their own. We can't tell you how, how to do that. It's clear that there's one clear thing missing from your model, and it's uh, like you know, and it's insurance. We don't have insurance in, 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 in the digital world like we have here, and the reason that we don't have insurance is yeah. because of crime. Now we're going to get way off subject because we came here to talk about threat characterization. <laughs> And you're right. Insurance is a mitigating, mitigating some risk by transferring the cost to somebody else. But let's talk insurance offline if you want to do that. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Let me uh, just repeat the question because I know we promised we'd do that. You want to know where the rating the hacker falls into during the, the incident management process? Tell me. For instance, uh, 
If you go, if you, and by the way, just just as a general reference, this whole writing the hacker thing, I, I plan on putting into a script. That way, people won't have to actually have a long checklist, and it takes you know an hour to do it. But to get into your point, um, it it would help if you if you run through the whole thing, and it comes up with you know your your adversary is say a script kitty. You might not want to dedicate your whole incident response team to you know doing the forensics, doing this, doing that, bringing the box down, you know, whatever, whatever is part of your incident response. Whereas if it, if you come up and it's this uh, this you know the the whole attack it comes up and says it's a, a professional, you know, then you can dedicate your your resources. It's a tool that management can use to gauge um, not only the threat level but the, you know what kind of resources they're going to need in order to respond to any kind of an incident. You could use this even on false positives and intrusion detection. You know, so let's go right over here. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, how do you differentiate based on attribution when someone might do parallel paths of attack, one which is really noisy, one which is stealthy, that are linked to the same person, or you might have two attacks that you link to the same person that actually aren't, correct? To be honest with you, there, there's no way you can tell. Um, if, like, if you, if guy hacks a box in Canada and then goes out and hacks a box in, uh, in, in Hungary and attacks you, you know, at the same time, there's no way you can tell it's the same person, you know, uh, unless you start looking at statistics, which is, you know, which right now we don't have, but we're going to start getting that statistics. But uh, then again, profiling or rating is never 100% accurate anyway. So... The, the data that, I, that I'm working on is coming off my own honeypots and my own experiences within my organization. But I, I do have, we do have plans, and I am talking to other people about getting more data to create sampling, to, to give more statistics rather than just a model. You got anything? As I, uh, I said earlier, um, the, the technical analysis is not the, uh, the be all and end all of the, of the overall characterization, it's only a part of it. Um, but obviously in the case of, so you're saying if, if you had two attacks on a single machine from two separate locations, right? Okay, well, if, I mean, obviously there's a question of time frame. If, if you have a very quiet network, um, and, and you have, or, or if you have a busy network and a machine which maybe, you know, people don't know about in the public domain, um, and you suddenly get, you know, an attack from two separate locations within the same hour, you know, and you haven't had any attacks on that system within the last six months, and obviously, you know, that might give you an inkling that, you know, someone is, or, or a group of people are trying to target that system. Um, then obviously you look at, you know, the attack method the method of attack they're using, the reconnaissance methods they're using. Um, do you think that in the second attack um, they, they're using information they gathered during the first attack? Um, are they using information in the second attack that they couldn't have possibly have known without carrying it the first attack? So I think there are ways which you can establish whether it's... Uh, right. I had a question over here and then I see you over on that side. Yeah, go ahead.
the um, the question is on capabilities of terrorists uh, and disposability and will you get the same impact from a cyber terrorism attack as you would from a physical attack. Uh, with regards to capabilities, I agree. Uh, typically when I talk on cyber terrorism, it's a two hour presentation. And one of the slides that I put up is kind of the state uh, of where we see things at right now. And it says those with the intent lack the capability. Uh, so yeah, they might intend to try and take the power down on the East Coast, but they don't have the capability right now. The caveat there though, is that we know that this is something that's on their radar screen. We know that they're trying to acquire the capability. So we need to be planning for that uh, out over the long term. The other aspect is we don't know how far in their planning window or capability acquisition process that they are. Uh, so just because it's not something that they currently could do or are assessed as being capable of doesn't mean that it's not a threat that we're going to face. Uh, and we categorize that. It's more in the emerging threat uh, category. You also have to remember the issues of convergence where you might have a threat entity or an individual or group that is capable of launching the attack that either for monetary reasons or ideological or political reasons would converge with a terrorist organization and engage in an attack that uh, would fall under a more of a cyber terrorism profile. Uh, with regards to impact, yeah, I agree the physically blowing stuff up is much more sensational, uh, has a much higher impact. Uh, and we've debated on this issue since like 1995 over whether can you even call cyber terrorism terrorism because you're talking about different aspects. In the definition that, that I provided, we think we need to look at it from a, a terrorism perspective where it's a st sustained attack. It's causing either, you know, political coercion, public panic, what we call uh, disruption of social integrity, where it starts to impact the operation of the nation, maybe your foreign policy. Uh, so we wanted to, you know, even though it's not as sensational, we wanted to address it within that terrorism context. At right here in the gray shirt. Can you speak up a little bit, please? There's a question with regards to value and utility. I won't repeat the whole thing, but I'll let uh, Tom and Toby <laughs> address it. Um, as I said earlier, um, I'll say it again. The side you're looking at um, is, is firstly completely technical. It's not, it, you know, it wouldn't take into account any kind of, you know, psychological profiling of, you know, you may consider yourself a high-end adversary and not a script kitty, um, and maybe that is a technique that high-end adversaries would use, you know, to maybe flood the IDS. So it, <laughs> so it, you know, so so you know, an administrator, you know, spends days looking through his IDS logs, and by the time you know he finds those ICMP packets that you're talking about, um, you know, the system's already been compromised. Um, but there are two sides to this: there are the um, kind of theoretical threat modeling side and a um, an incident response stage. Um, and in the theoretical side, you know, we, we, we've, we've discussed this as a group and there is every opportunity, uh, there's every chance that, you know, someone may do exactly what you're speaking of and, you know, th the threat model would, you know, have to, you know, you know would take that into account. Um, on, a, um, on a practical side, um, well, it, it it really wouldn't matter because, I mean, you know, the incident is going to happen whether you like it or not. Um, all you can do is, you know, look at, you know, why that attack was successful against your network and, you know, how we can adapt the, th the, the threat model to... I'm 
I'm not worried about the things to know about. I'm worried about the group kids that, look, I'm not going to really see it. Um, and my point is that with your drug modeling, it seems like you're missing. The, there's so many drugs out there that the value of being able to categorize those threats past a, a, you know, we were done with the instant response. I'm like, I need the FBI to go after this guy because you know, what they're really going to do is damage. But my point is, where there's no real value um, in the immediate, because there's just, it's, you can't defend yourself against all the threats. It's a post response, not a pro response. Okay. okay um, so, what, so what you're saying is you don't think that we can learn from characterizations made after, after an incident? I'm just trying to find out where you guys are coming from, value, where's the value at? Okay, well obviously you, you're going to, you know, once an incident has happened, you're going to change your threat model, you know, based on your characterizations, there's going to be the side of, well, you know, in this attack did, you know, how much reconnaissance was done, did the guy use social engineering attacks prior to making the compromise? Um, you know, these things, as I said earlier about the whole social engineering age devi deviation thing, um, you know, that tells us some stuff about the attacker. Um, you know, it's all little pieces of the pie um, that we, you know, in this case, um, you know, might use to pass on to the FBI to, you know, to help characterize, you know, to help, you know, find who we're looking for that, that committed the, you know. Um, furthermore, um, say if you're running, um, you know, a, a server on a bank network, let's say, it may help you characterize the kind of people who are likely who are going to try and get into that machine. Um, you know the, the facility that they have available to them to in order to do that. You know the exploits that they have access to. You know the people that they talk to, the people that they know. You know how high are they on that <coughs> vulnerability disclosure food chain? Um, do, do you see where we're coming from? Let me. I've got. Let me just add a couple of points. That, hey, what, no model is ever going to be perfect. Uh, and that's agreed. And there's probably a lot of folks in here that would be, you know, a sophisticated adversary, and they're going to be able to circumvent or exploit the model uh, in order to launch their attack. Have to remember, though, there's probably, you know, 99 percent of the folks that are out there aren't going to. Uh, and you're going to be able to characterize a lot of those and use that kind of to guide resources. Uh, from the planning perspective, or at least from my perspective, when I look at being able to characterize and do scorecards or, you know, even if it's historical analysis, I can now start applying that to the future. Uh, we talked about this at Black Hat as well. One thing that we're lacking is, you know, when the FBI goes out and does a psychological profile of serial killers, they go out and interview 100 serial killers and they start to develop the profile. Well, in our industry, we don't do any of that profiling. We don't do any of that characterization. So when we're trying to do the planning component and look at adversary levels, and I have to do this on a daily basis, Mark has to do it on a daily basis. We've got those threat agent types up there, but we don't have any real historical background to talk about what the capabilities are. Lessons learned, and as you start to have a historical use of the model, you can start applying it to planning in the future. Uh, and the real-time driving of resources for those uh, that might not be sophisticated enough to circumvent whatever model you're using. Add one over here, and then I'll get over there. Yep. Let me just step out on a limb a little bit here. Um, it, it's a hard question to answer unless you're looking at it forensically in a terms of gaining attribution as to who exactly did what we're looking at. Part of this is not just the pattern of behavior in terms of, you know, did they break in first by scanning, then by, you know, gaining a foothold, et cetera, but capturing 
the, the actual artifacts, uh, building a library of artifacts, being able to compare those against uh, older signatures, for example. Um, much like profiling in, in the physical criminal world, if you've got a serial killer, they will leave behind forensic evidence you know, that's collected and compared, and you can compare it against other um, you know, person X, person Y, person Z, and you can start to build a profile where you can see characteristics of individuals or groups based on the evidence they leave behind. Now, that will eventually, if done correctly, lead you to attribution towards the actual person you're looking for, but it does help characterize when you when you see a new event come up. If you can compare backwards, you can find those those signatures or fingerprints, so that you can you can continue the pattern. It helps to understand from a forensic standpoint. The gentleman's earlier question about how does that help me in the future to prevent intrusions? I don't think we can. It really doesn't provide you with much there. The way to prevent that is patch yourself and you know close the vulnerabilities. What we're looking at is how do you then characterize somebody who's already broken in to gain attribution to bring that case to closure. And yes, you can spoof it. Yes, you can introduce noise. I mean, that's all part of the signature. And you would learn those characteristics of your adversary who does things such as making themselves look like a script kitty or making themselves look like something that they're not as a smoke screen. That'll be a characteristic of that individual or of that group. Take uh, two more questions and then we'll have to call it quits, I think, on the room, unless I get the nod otherwise. But we'll certainly all be here. Uh, Go ahead, right here in the back. Uh, I'm just curious, because he's sort of being bounced around by the level. Is there a way to sort of look at that and say, okay, this is what you're doing The, the question, to, to <clears throat> put it briefly, is what role do you see the model playing in doing trend analysis uh, over time to guide response, internal security posture, alerting, things of that sort? Toby? As far as the data being shared with the community goes, yes. The data will be shared with the community. Um, we plan on doing the trend analysis. Uh, we also plan on trying to get more people in here who can, in our, in our little group, who can provide uh, more information that we can use in our trend analysis and that can help us, you know, do the profiling that can help, that, you know, they can help us make this a more value-added you know, uh, model than what we currently have. I don't know if I answered the question. Okay. We've got one more back here, then we got to release the room, but we'll all be up at the front for question and answers. Uh, you can ask the question. If you've got a beer in your hand, Mark will answer. <laughs> yeah. The question is, does Homeland Security have any plans to incorporate any sort of funding for training uh, of folks that operate critical infrastructures? Yes, is the short answer. Um, one of the major things that the department will be doing in terms of uh, outreach, training, and awareness is exactly that, raising the, the level of uh, understanding. Um, from a pure cyber perspective, of course, this is a shared responsibility. It's not something that just the government can do. Each of us have to work with it. From a larger more physical perspective in terms of the critical infrastructures, part of our role in this is determining the interdependencies of those infrastructures. Um, how does the rail network depend on the power grid? I mean, some of it's kind of obvious, but there are other interdependencies that we're, we're trying to uncover through doing um, uh, simulation modeling, et cetera. 
but in terms of the education awareness, absolutely. Uh, there's a large part of the department that's being focused on that. Uh, we're somewhat immature at the moment. We're only about six months old. So if we come back here next summer, I can give you a lot better answers to it. And um, I think you'll like what you'll see. Thanks a lot, right, ladies and gentlemen. You. I really appreciate your time. Do it now.